Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Mary Harry Post Show Party. Vianne, are you there? Hi! Hey! Oh, oh, oh virtual hug, virtual <laughs> hug. Oh, gosh, I'm exhausted and elated. How about you? I feel like I've just had an opening night. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm thrilled. It was amazing to see all the hard work uh, pay off. You were wonderful, David. <laughs> oh, you as well, and your pictures uh, look fabulous. Uh, thank you, thanks. And thanks to you all that tuned in to watch it with us. Yes, yes, and, and now, now it's gonna live on streamingmusicals.com anytime that you would like to see it again. Yeah, I, I think we have a, a special treat as well, a uh, one-time only special discount code for 50% off, uh, good for purchase of Mary Harry, uh, only until midnight on May 26th, and you can purchase us and watch us forever. Uh, the code is to use at streamingmusicals.com, and that is one word, Mary Harry 50 and, it, and it's not going to be shared anywhere else. It's just for the people who were here tonight enjoying our, our wonderful premiere and our opening night, and it's just for you and your friends uh, to own Mary Harry forever. Uh, uh, Mary speaking, Harry 50 Speaking of friends, I think we have some other people in the room. Hello, David. Hello, Bill. Hey, Bill. Oh, Mr. Guys. Hello, world. I'm Bill Castellino. I directed and choreographed Mary Harry on uh, tonight, our opening night. I'm thrilled. Happy to our see you. Our themed director. Woo! <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Oh, what a night. What an amazing treat this has turned into. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Who Thank else is you. here? Somebody. Yeah. Oh. Me, Jennifer Manicurian. I'm the book writer. Woohoo to everybody. Woohoo, <laughs> Jennifer. So great to see you all for our virtual launch. Would have been nicer in person, but we'll take it. It's good. Yeah. And I'm um, Dan Martin. I wrote the music and I did the orchestration. And Hi, everybody. Hey. 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 And it, I love seeing all of you. I mean, I I've been spotting you on screen, but I'm so seeing you again on screen. But. Oh, it's <laughs> nice to see you both. Thank you so much for your music and your story and what li lyrics. Wonderful. Look who it is. Okay. Ah, the cast. The cast has arrived. <laughs> I am Phelan. I play Sherry. So good to see you guys. Hi, Hi everybody. Hey. You also have a trail, oh, Big Harry. Oh, cool. <laughs> Oh, oh, good to see my family. I love you all. Oh, <laughs> Hi, Paul. Oh. Hi, Vianne. Hi, everybody. It's yes, Jesse. Hey. 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 Oh, really? Yeah, look good. Tony. Oh, sorry. I'm on. Oh. Hi, I'm Tony. I'm Tony. I was Village Voice number, whichever one you want to pick. <laughs> Tony. Hey, I love did you, you all. Say you, did you say Hi, you? everyone. Good to see you guys. I'm Kim. Cool. Up, Kim. Kim. I see the yeah. camera loves everyone. That's great. <laughs> Opening night, night. Opening, opening night, opening night, opening night. All right. <laughs> Look at these faces. Uh -huh. Gosh, our happy little uh, clan, our, our happy little <laughs> band of merry players. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know about mm -hmm. all of you, but I could use a little post-show drink and maybe a little nosh because I'm famished. Well, man, lucky for us, uh, we've got our friend. The amazing Sarah Tracy joining us, who is a certified sommelier. She has proudly worked her way up from wine tasting spit bucket emptier to Michelin starred <laughs> wine director. She regularly shares food pairing, um, home entertaining, and beverage expertise with O, the Oprah Magazine, Food and Wine, the Food Network, L, Refinery 29, Town and Country, Cosmopolitan, Pure Wow, Forbes, Brides, and Cheddar TV. And we have her here tonight to be with us. Yay. She's named Yay. one of the top 20 wine influencers in all the US. And she's here with us. Let's welcome Sarah Tracy to the Mary Harry family. First of all, a huge congratulations to the cast and the creative team of Mary Harry. Great job, everybody. Hey, thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. I am so excited to be able to celebrate you today. I, uh, my name is Sarah Tracy. I'm a professional sommelier and lifestyle expert. I've worked at more than one Italian restaurant in my day. 
And I've also been fortunate enough to travel pretty frequently to Italy after the, over the past few years, just to research their food and wine culture. So I wanted to show all of you how to bring a little bit of Italy into your own kitchen. And of course, we have to kick off with cocktails. So I know in the musical, uh, we're starting with a bottle of Prosecco, we're ending with a glass of Limoncello. Yes, I see some people have their wine ready to go. Great job, everybody. Yes, I even see some Limoncello out there. Yes, Kim. Him. He's on top of it. 11.30 yes. a.m. where I'm at right now. <laughs> 11.35. You know, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> so I am going to show you how to actually make a quick cocktail that combines both Prosecco and Limoncello, and then we're going to do a mocktail, too, so everyone can participate. So uh, this is a kind of a play on a spritz, but all you have to do is start with a wine glass with some ice and... If you can grab a bottle of limoncello from your local liquor store, that's fine. If you want to go Martha Stewart on me and make your own, there's definitely a lot of recipes online for that. Just lemon slices, sugar, and vodka. But this is just some pre-made limoncello. And I'm going to glug about an ounce and a half into my wine glass. And then I went ahead and popped my bottle of Prosecco. And all you have to do here is just fill your glass up about three quarters of the way. It might foam up a little bit. That's completely fine. Just go slow. And then I'm going to top off with a splash of sparkling water. And this cocktail is called a spritz because in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, they had a lot of Austrian soldiers camped out all over northern Italy, and I guess the wine was way too strong for them. And so they started adding a splash of sparkling water to the wine to make it a little bit more palatable. And the German word for that action is spritz. So that's how this very Italian cocktail ended up with a German name somehow. But with this, I'm going to kind of take us to the Amalfi Coast and add a sprig of fresh basil. Mm -hmm. Kind of top it off. And that's so pretty and easy. I'm telling you, when you sip it, you will feel like you are on the Amalfi Coast just enjoying life. Yeah, somewhere other than where we are. Yeah. <laughs> I think we could all use a mental trip to southern Italy right now. Question. Um, yeah, of course. What about... What about um, mixing the drink or shaking it is that just it because it's so delicate how you're doing it yeah um, I'd say if you want to just you know swizzle either with a spoon or with your herb spray just to kind of combine the flavors but you don't want to shake this in a <laughs> cocktail shaker the Prosecco would have its own yeah, part Dave. so <laughs> yes yeah, anybody else questions yeah I thought spritz meant sh to sweat like, Maybe it, I think that's Schwitz. 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 Schwitz in your drink. <laughs> so if, it's, if you're Schwitzing, you might want to have a, a cold or refreshing spritz in your hand. That's a Jewish thing, not an Italian. Exactly. I'm going to say, Jennifer, don't you have Jewish family? <laughs> Well, then I have another um, variation on this that is actually non-alcoholic. And when I travel to Italy, it's so important to them that everyone at the table, you're all one family and you're all sharing this experience together. So even if you don't drink or you're not old enough to drink or for whatever reason, you still should be able to participate in this ritual. And so I love the zero proof version of this cocktail. What I did was I took um, some blood oranges, which are like a Sicilian type of orange. They're so beautiful because inside they have, as you can mm. see, like a really deep, mm. gorgeous kind of purple flesh. And they make this stunning color of like a magenta juice. So mm. I juiced one blood orange mm. and I'm going to throw that kind of in lieu of our lemon jello. Mm. Mm. Uh, instead of Prosecco, I'm just going to use a flavored soda of your choice. I have the San Pellegrino, keeping it Italian, the Pompelmo flavor, which is like a grapefruit, but you can have fun with this and kind of use whichever kind of soda you like. Already that color is looking amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm going to, just like I did with the Prosecco Limoncello version, I'm going to top it off with a little bit of our spritz of sparkling water. 
And then finally, with this, I did a rosemary sprig. I love oh. orange and rosemary together. <laughs> so you can top it off with that. And the oh. herbs just give this beautiful, like, aromatic quality when you sip the drink. Oh my God, I'm schwitzing just thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> and it is truly every bit as delicious as the limoncello and prosecco version. So this and calling the Amalfi spritz. This, oh, I will yes. call it zero proof. Cheers. And cheers, everyone. Congrats. Cheers. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> Cheers. Hey, Sarah, aren't, aren't, isn't there a number of cocktail, Italian cocktails that feature fruit and, and sparkles, like uh, Blini and <laughs> yeah. Aperol drink and a couple of, is that unique to Italy, these sparkling cocktails? I feel like mimosas, Bellinis, Aperol spritz, as far as I know, they all originated in Italy, but pretty much every culture has their own version. So Spain has some Spanish cocktails, France has a couple that they do, but really the original is Italians. And I think what I love about the Italian food and wine culture is that it's very, very simple, but you have to have a really high quality ingredients. That's kind of wonderful for home cooks because it's not fussy like like French cuisine and cooking is where you have to learn all this fancy technique. It really is about fresh produce, wonderful olive oil, delicious cheese and salumi. And as long as you have these high quality products, you really aren't doing much to them. Um, which brings me to my next treat I have for you guys, which <laughs> In Italy, you never ever see wine without food and you rarely see food without wine, unless maybe breakfast, like an espresso and a cornetto might be breakfast, but even with lunch, they might have a wine or a spritz or a prosecco, some kind of cocktail. And then my favorite Italian tradition is called aperitivo. Aperitivo is essentially that time at the end of the day when you're winding down your day, you might get together with friends and family and have a spritz and then have just some little snacks. And so I made a really pretty um, board for you all. Oh! Ten that you're able to join in with, this, with me. Oh, mine! No, mine! <laughs> yes! No, oh, mine! Yes, I mine is show the, that mine is the Bronx budget <laughs> version. The Bronx oh, version with, Tony. with, uh, with uh, Tony. Tony. bread, because you can't find focaccia at the fine fair up here in the Bronx. Oh my gosh! I everyone's kid. I have one package. <laughs> I have a package. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> well, everyone's slumy boards look gorgeous. I'll give you a couple tips of you know what I put on mine. So clearly salumi, like pepperoni, um, prosciutto, things like that are always important. So I have like some cured meats that I put on here. Obviously Parmesan though. And my tip with this is if you get a block of Parmesan, just to kind of like chunk it up with a knife and make it look really rustic. They wouldn't do like a pretty clean slice in Italy. It would look kind of like someone just like, like Nonna broke it apart with her hands and just put it on the platter with love in her heart. And then I have some marinated, just roasted red peppers that you can get out of a jar. I always keep a bunch in my pantry. So a way to kind of use some of those pantry staples. Talking about that, I did a marinated balsamic and chili pepper gigante bean. If anyone over purchased beans in preparation for quarantine, yes, Vianne, this is your chance to use them. So you can just take, you know, your canned beans and marinate them in some olive oil and some good balsamic with like a little sprinkle of chili pepper and they are just delicious on top do of you the need to, Do you need to bread. cut the beans first or can like, like I was searching around so I got like um, butter beans. Was I, and I didn't, but I didn't really know what to do with them. Like, did I need to if they're canned, them? If they're canned butter beans, all you have to do is put them in a bowl, add the oil and vinegar and the chili. If they're dried, that's a more sticky situation. You have to soak them overnight and okay. boil them first. But I love canned beans because uh, they're just so simple and just a little simple, you know, dressing just makes them delicious. I can't believe what you're telling me right now about lima beans. That they can be <laughs> made into like this Italian treat. I'm from the yes. South. We just do lima beans with butter and ham, huh? Ah. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in, in Tuscany specifically, fava beans are one of the biggest crops besides olives and wine grapes, if you can believe it. So fava beans are huge in Italy and they're so tasty. 
Oh. As well oh, as the same. they're not the same as limas though. Slava, is I'm it using the I'm using butter beans today, but you could certainly use cannellini beans work really really well in this. Any kind of hearty white bean favas obviously are ideal if you can get your hands on those. I, I just I read something in the two New York Times about um, you know the part that we typically like r rinse our beans. Uh, oh yeah. If you're making a chili or something, you out of the can, right? And you, and you rinse the beans and then you make the chili. I heard that the, the the stuff that the beans come in can be turned into like a great treat, like a dip. Do you know anything yeah. about that? Um, I do know that a lot of vegan recipes use like the liquid of like a can of chickpeas instead of egg whites because they have, you know, that kind of protein to them. And apparently they have like a starchy protein quality that works really well as an egg white substitute. I personally have not tried that, but Bill, I think you should give it a, uh, give it a try and let, let the group report okay. back yeah. and let us know how it went. <laughs> And then I just got these fun little grissinis out um, from the grocery store. And you can just put them in like a little juice glass and they will stand upright and they just look, you know, really fancy like you're at an Italian restaurant. So I think that's a fun little like trick for making these look really fancy and cool and fun. Yeah. Hey, I have a question. You, and you had some olives up in your hand and I have some, yeah. I have some olive spread. What would be a good mm. thing to pair with olive spread? Just some grilled bread is probably what they would do in Italy. Like Ooh. they call them crostini. So you take a baguette, you slice it, you just brush it with a little olive oil and toast it in the oven at 350 for maybe like 10 minutes at the most, just till you get these little crunchy toasts. Mm. You can top them with the olive tapenade. That's a really, really classic um, and very delicious, um, you know, Italian delicacy. They would definitely do that there. Huh. Is everyone ready to taste a little bit of wine? Now that we've had our kickoff cocktail, we've had our aperitivo antipasto platter, I have a couple different wines to taste with you all. And I was inspired by the musical uh, because they have first a Bianco and then they have a Chianti. So I'm gonna teach you a couple of things about these. So a Bianco, good job everyone. Um, I, I drank half of it last night, though. <laughs> yes, that's okay. <laughs> Are we going to keep so, laughing a little bit harder uh, as this goes along? Like the, day song? I, Sorry. the more you sip, the probably the funnier I am. So we like that. <laughs> so with Italian white wines, um, Italy is so famous for their reds, Barolo, Brunello, uh, Chianti, of course. And people don't often think of Italy for white wines, so you can get just the most beautiful wines and they're really, really affordable for that reason because they're just not as in demand as the rich Italian reds. So popular Italian whites could be Pinot Grigio, uh, Vermentino, or Rieto, but um, I'm gonna teach you four quick steps to taste wine uh, like a sommelier. And once you learn these, you will always have the skill in your back pocket. And then I'll take you through the Chianti that I have. But if you have a glass of wine in front of you, feel free to follow along. Um, to sip like a psalm, the first step is to see the wine. So this is a step that's just all about assessing it with your eyes. And we want to get all of our senses involved in the wine, not just taste, but everything else also. So I'm not seeing any bubbles here. So it's not a sparkling wine like Prosecco. It is crystal clear and beautiful. And then one party trick I will teach you about white wine is that the older the wine is, the darker it gets in color. So if you yeah. see a really pretty light kind of translucent white, this is probably pretty young. Uh, a little oxygen enters the bottle through the cork. And as wine ages in the bottle, it'll continue to get like a deeper, darker amber color, but I can tell this one's pretty young. Um, then what you wanna do is just roll a wine in your glass and you'll see these little, when you hold it upright again, you're gonna see little drips of wine coming down the side. And that's, <laughs> these are called legs in wine speak. So fancy way to say the drips of liquid coming down the side of the glass, those are legs. And all those tell us is how thick the wine is. If you can imagine doing this with like heavy cream and it would be really slow and thick to come down oh, versus really? skim milk would be like thin and shoot right down fast. Um, this will kind of indicate to us if the wine is thick, which makes it full bodied 
or whether it's very thin and that's a light bodied wine. So that's a fun way to kind of tell something about the body before you've even tasted it. Does that, does that determine whether it's cheap or expensive? <laughs> No, you can have very <laughs> expensive light-bodied wines and really expensive full-bodied wines and okay. cheap as well. So it doesn't really indicate quality, but I will tell you in a little bit the way you can tell the quality of the wine because we're getting there. Uh, the next step is to swirl the wine and the safest way to do this is to put your glass down on a flat surface and make little circles with the base of your glass. If you're feeling daring, you can do it in midair like that. <laughs> but I think there's nothing wrong with doing it on your tabletop and that's just releasing the aromas and it tends to wake up the wine a little bit. When wine's in a bottle, those flavor molecules don't have as much access to oxygen so they basically take a nap, hibernate a little bit. So if you want them to like wake up and activate for you, uh, swirling the wine, getting oxygen into it will be a nice way to achieve that. Like and that gets us fun. ready. That gets us ready to sniff the wine. So this is a very professional uh, step that most people have no idea why we do this. You just know that you look fancy if you sniff your wine. <laughs> but the reality of this is that your mouth can taste five things, sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami. And your nose can smell two billion things. And so by oh, isolating that, that sense of umami? smell, what, what do you think? umami, umami, and with this nose, I got an extra billion. <laughs> yes. what is umami, umami is. Hang on, let me tell you what's in my wine. <laughs> umami is what they call the fifth taste that um, you get in really savory, like earthy things. So think about like miso, parmesan, soy sauce, those kinds of like really earthy, savory, like unctuous aromas and flavors. That's mushrooms is a good example. That's umami, the fifth taste. But when you smell the wine, you get, sometimes you get flowers or herbs or toastiness or butter, or vanilla. You know, there's so much that you can get with your nose that you might not necessarily detect on the palate. Your mouth, we can call it the palate to sound like a fancy wine person. And then the after you've explored the aromas a little bit, it's finally time to sip the wine. That's everyone's favorite. And I wanna urge everybody to swish the wine around in your mouth because we're not only trying to get the flavor on your tongue, but we want to understand something about the texture of the wine. So I'll show you how I do it. And it looks a little silly, but if you're daring, you can try it out. <laughs> so voila. Right. So I kind of slurped the air it like again. I was, uh, well, it's your turn. I'm going to see you all try it. I want Let the wine. Just take a little in your mouth and let it sit on your tongue and just sip a little air over the top like you're sipping through a straw. <laughs> what if I've cheated and it's iced tea? The same thing. You can still no one would the know. same thing with your palate, exactly. <laughs> and then, and I want everyone to notice, is it making your gums tingle? Is it making your mouth water? Is it making your tongue feel like rough and sandpapery? The point of this wish is really to get more texture indicators out of this baby. So mm. most Italian wines are going to have that mouth watering factor. You're gonna get your saliva glands cranking because they're usually pretty high in acidity. So they- um, Makes them really good. We're, we're Campari drinkers here. Nice. I just did this thing that you said with the, bre with the breathing and it actually shifted the taste of what it is that I'm that I know about Campari. So it's also I'm seeing that it's not just wine, maybe. Yeah, I mean, you can do this with spirits as well. Doing that, from breathing it in and yeah, even coffee, tea. I mean, all of those yeah. things. Like by getting all of your senses activated, and it's a different experience. You know, it's more mindful. You're really paying attention to what's happening in your mouth. You're feeling those sensations and you're also experiencing the flavor and the aroma kind of all coming together. And you can do this, professional cheese tasters will basically do the same thing. 
any sort of saws, you know, you're going to get a more magnified experience if you're able to really do this like sensory exploration, we call it attended tasting. I sort of say it's like putting on 3D glasses. You know, you might just sip the wine and enjoy it, but once you really take the time to explore it, it really comes alive in a different way. Wow, that's neat. Yeah, it's magical. Um, I also have a Chianti, and you all can continue sipping, but I know Chianti plays a character in the musical, and I want to talk a little bit about it because there's an amazing story behind this wine that I think wine is so fascinating because there's so much, um, so much history and culture that goes into each bottle. So I have this bottle, this is Rufino Reserva de Cale, and Chianti is a place, it's a place in Tuscany, in central Italy on the west coast, and there's Chianti, which is a pretty big wine region, and then there's Chianti Classico, which is a small region within the bigger Chianti, so think about it as like New York State and New York City. You have Chianti, and then you have Chianti Classico in the middle. Chianti Classico is where the best wines in the region are made. And it's got a really amazing story. So it's located between two cities, Florence and Siena. And back in the medieval days, uh, there was a lot of battling over who controlled the wine region. Was it the city of Florence? Was it the town of Siena? So they had two knights like knights on horses, kinds of knights, that uh, decided that they would both leave their respective cities when the rooster crowed at the crack of dawn, and that was their signal that they could start riding. And wherever they met, whoever got further <laughs> and had the majority of the land could claim the Chianti Classical wine region as part of their city. And Florence was represented by a black rooster, and Siena was represented by a white rooster. And essentially what happened is the Florentines um, did all sorts of crazy stuff to their rooster. They, you know, sleep deprived it for days. They didn't feed it. They trapped it in a dark room. They like quarantined their rooster and they made the rooster like a little coop crazy. And so when they let, when they finally let him out, he, crowed way before the actual break of dawn because his sense of time and space and what time of day it was was completely like skewed and so that night got like an hour head start because the rooster crowed so early and so florence ended up taking the control of the territory and now when you look at a bottle of chianti classico you see a black rooster oh my God. on the back of the label and that is because, yeah, see, David's got it. <laughs> yeah. Mine comes so from all of these... hub across the street, so I don't think they had that. <laughs> has like a chicken on it. There's no rooster. <laughs> <laughs> no rooster. I don't know. It has a, it has a screw <laughs> off top. <laughs> right. <laughs> screw caps? <laughs> yeah, Sarah, screw tell caps us are actually great. Yeah. Tell us about tell screw us... caps. Yeah, yeah. screw tops. Um, so screw cap wines are one of probably the most misunderstood types of wine packaging. And I wanna urge everybody to not fear the screw cap because I'm gonna see if I have an example. Hold on one second. All right, so this is a natural cork. This is a natural cork and this is what was in my bottle of Chianti Classico. Well, this cork is harvested from the bark of the cork oak tree and it's really porous, and depending on the conditions where they process this into a cork shape, if there's not good hygiene at that factory, it can actually Ooh. contaminate the cork and can get a nasty bacteria in it that can then infect the whole bottle of wine. And as many as maybe like six or 7% of all bottles with a natural cork actually have this infection. Unfortunately, I had one last night. I opened a really beautiful bottle of Pinot Noir, and unfortunately, it had been contaminated. The cork um, and that bacteria will make the wine taste kind of moldy or musty or like damp cardboard, wet newspapers, that kind of really gross. Like you don't want to have that taste sensation. It's well, not so it's harmful. Much for and that's uh, been made in Italy for the last couple of months, right? You know, 
a lot of factories have stepped up their you know production practices mm -hmm. the really bad quirks were happening more in like the 90s so mm -hmm. understanding that this huge infection happened with natural cork uh, a lot of winemakers said we don't want to have you know 10 percent of our wines enter the market and be completely undrinkable Right. There's got to be a better way. And so some brave winemakers in New Zealand, this is back in the 70s actually, uh, decided why don't we take the same type of twist off cap that you're using on vodka, whiskey, you know, your spirits, and why don't we seal our wine bottles with the same kind of cap? And that way you have zero chance of your wine being contaminated mm -hmm. by a faulty cork. So for a lot of winemakers, it actually made a lot more sense because the innovation, you know, a glass bottle with a natural cork, that's from like the 1300s. You know, the only substance that was malleable that they could find in nature that could actually seal a bottle was a cork. But now we have so much more innovation available to us. And so the cork itself now is more of a traditional, you know, nod to winemaking history that many winemakers think that a twist off is actually better for the environment because it uses less material. Um, it's recyclable, they're made of aluminum, they are lighter to ship, so you have a lower carbon footprint on the wine, and then you have no chance that the wine can be spoiled. So or breaking the cork off. Or breaking the cork yes. off in the top. And I do a lot of serving when I'm not making movies. And so yes. like, it's just so much easier to just do this and say, would you like some wine, sir? Than trying to like pull and pull and then it's, you yeah. have to push it down. Nobody likes that. Yeah, you don't have to travel with a wine key, you know, if you want to just bring a bottle on a picnic, you know, it's easier. And I love that you can screw the cap back on and just put the bottle back in the fridge if you have any leftover wine, which doesn't often happen in my house, but <laughs> if you don't finish the whole bottle, screw it back on, put it in the fridge, and screw caps are great. Um, most of the fellow sommeliers that I know, we love them. Uh, it's more consumers of a little gun shy. They feel like maybe the wine is cheap if it has a twist off cap, but that's not necessarily true. The type of packaging doesn't always indicate the quality inside. Isn't there another like plastic funky, isn't something that really it defies the corkscrew, but it's still yeah. inserted in the <laughs> bottle and it's all your good corkscrew um, uh, techniques don't work really well on it. Yeah, those are synthetic corks that are made of like plastic or rubber or other substances. And to be honest, like those are the only corks that I'm not a fan of. Um, I feel like they don't have the user friendly aspect of the screw top, but they don't have that traditional heritage of a natural cork. Uh, and I think that, you know, people are using them because they don't want to risk that, you know, contamination in the wine, but they don't trust that consumers will you know, want to buy it if they use a screw cap. So they're sort of cheating you. You know, if you buy a bottle of wine and it has this foil capsule, you can't really tell whether it has a natural cork or rubber cork mm. until you get it home and try to open it. And I think sometimes um, people will try to make a wine look higher quality and more expensive than it actually is when they use those types of rubber corks. So I think it's a little bit of a fake out. I'm not a huge fan of those. I like the risk involved with a natural cork. It's like, maybe it's no. good, maybe it's not. <laughs> you know, it's a risk. It's a risk. I think if you're investing in like a $100 bottle of aged yeah, which weren't, which Rolo, weren't a you might not want to risk it. But <laughs> it's part of, oh, I, I was going to teach you all how to tell uh, about the wine quality. This is a really easy way. Um, if you sip the wine, and you swallow it, I want you to pay attention to how long you can still taste the wine. Mm. One, two, five seconds, 10 seconds. Can you still experience those echoes of flavor rolling across your tongue? This is called the finish of the wine, which is essentially a fancy way to say the aftertaste. And the longer the finish extends, the higher quality the wine. Oh Sometimes you'll taste a wine, it'll disappear right away. And people that judge wine competitions to kind of assess like the highest quality wines in the world, it's one of the main things they're actually looking at is how long that finish lasts. Well, so you can tell if you go to like a party and you can tell if they're serving you cheap wine. If you well, like. Wine lasted a long time, but it was only like, I don't know, $16. You know, price and quality don't always go hand in hand with wine. What? Uh, it's kind of, it's hard to explain, um, but 
you know, you can get some very high quality wines that are, you know, under $20, depending on, you know, where they're from, supply and demand. Well, it's um, true for a lot of wine pricing. My, my, per yeah. my, my performances come very cheap, but they're excellent. <laughs> <laughs> the quality yeah, is always you know, 100%. <laughs> and I think, you know, to understand, like, you know, those expensive wines, people ask me all the time, like, is it really worth it to buy like a hundred dollar bottle of wine? Is it really that much better than a $10 bottle, $15 bottle? And I always urge people to think about wine as more of an experience and less of a commodity. It depends on how you value it and what it means to you. If you're a collector that's waited your whole life to get your hand on some cult bottle of wine and you have the money to spend and you have been craving this experience and it just blows your mind, like it might be worth it for you to pay several hundred dollars for a bottle of wine. If you're just not that into wine, like it would never be worth it for you. And I always kind of talk about um, theater as a similar thing. You know, if you love musical theater, you might pay happily pay a thousand dollars for a ticket to Hamilton and love every second of it. And the experience is worth it for you. But uh, what if you know, the guy plus <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but you know, my brother that doesn't like theater, he would be like, why would you ever pay more than, you know, $25 to see this show. So Where wine, those very expensive wines are almost the same. It's more about the experience and less about like the actual price of the bottle and the cork and the label and the juice. So, and the experience is connected to who you're with and how, how yes. your day is going. And, and, you know, um, I think some of us have always been told uh, we're judged by the company we keep. And if you keep good company that enjoys um, life in that way, many bottles of wine would do the job. <laughs> it's really about the experience. And that's another reason why, uh, you know, you really shouldn't worry too much about point scores with wine. You know, a wine got 90 points, 95 points, you know, the critic, if they had a bad day, if they had a fight with their husband, if they are tired, sick, they're going to give the wine a lower score most probably. And so don't, and if, you know, a lot of wine is subjective. Yeah. Michael and Dan question. The scene is, we're invited to a, a, a kind of fancy dinner party and we want to contribute a bottle of wine to that. So what is a safe for wine snobs or people that are just in, into that? Yeah. Part of it, what is something safe to bring to a party? I'd say um, I love Italian wine. I know we've been talking a lot about Italian food and wine today, but you can get some amazing values coming out of Italy. Um, and one thing they do that really helps us with Italian wine is that they put this little sticker. If anyone has this um, sticker, it's brown and it says D-O-C-G. <laughs> yeah, we have a couple, Paul, yeah, D-O-C-G. Yeah, David. Yeah. What does it mean? So, what does it mean? I, 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 I have that one. Long time. There is a blue sticker that says D-O-C which I have on my Prosecco. So DOC, DOCG. So what basically happened is that the Italian um, government has an agency that gives quality ratings to food and wine products. And the highest quality, like the top level, gets this DOCG sticker. And so uh, you can also see this on some cheeses, on some Prosciutto di Parma, for example, is considered like the highest quality of, of cured ham in Italy. So that might have that same kind of seal of approval. And so I find that makes it really easy when you're in the wine shop. Um, when you see this DOCG, it just means that it's considered the top, top, top tier of quality of that region. Um, there are, you know, Chianti's that are only DOC the blue, which is considered like a little step below DOCG. So I think that's a good trick, a good oh. hack. I also think for a party, um, my kind of secret trick is I love to bring Magnum bottles. It's a really big, large format, like the double size, uh, just cause they're so festive and special and they're meant for a crowd and they're kind of a showstopper to bring that to an event. Mm -hmm. So if you have a nice wine shop near you, uh, and they have anything in, we call them large format, you know, big bottles, I think are always fun at a party. Thanks. Sorry. Anyone I'm else have you. questions? I'm sorry. I, I have my window open. I apologize. So then you may have heard motorcycles or dogs barking. Or I don't know. <laughs> it's New York. 
No need yeah. to apologize. Well, that's so, all right. But, you know, I, I always used to think you couldn't tell the difference in taste because I'm not a wine connoisseur, as you can tell by my teeth. But I once, somebody once brought us a bottle of Opus One. Is that what it's called? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's one of the first times I've tasted a wine and I thought, wow, that's a really good wine. I, I mean, I could really tell the difference. I mean, is that, is, uh, am I off in some way or is it my, or did I detect something that's just kind of, if it had been a $30 wine, it would have been just as good? Uh, I think that we all have those bottles that like, for some reason, um, I met a winemaker once and I asked him that same question. And he said, you know, sometimes a wine just rings your bell. Sometimes it just hits a chord with you that you might not be a wine connoisseur, you might not have a really developed palate, might not have all this history, knowledge around wine, but, you know, it rings your bell. It just, you know, hits a pleasure center in you. And when you get to taste those bottles, remember them and seek them out again. If Two Buck Shock rings your bell, I am all about it. Everyone, thank you so much for uh, bringing me into your homes, letting me share my Italian wine and food passion with you today. And congratulations on thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank the you, Sarah. film. Thank you. Cheers. Wonderful, Sarah. Thank you. Salute. Ah, salute. Salute. Cheers. Model. <laughs> hey, everybody. I propose a toast. Tonight is our world premiere of Mary Harry, the musical. It is a once in a lifetime experience. Mm. Seeing you again brings tears to my eyes, but mm. the movie brings such joy to my heart. <laughs> and looking at your beautiful faces, even virtually, really makes me humbled and grateful to be alive with you. So oh. I cheer you and I cheer mm. Mary Harry, and I cheer this opportunity to share our work with the world, world, bring it on. We know how to love you. Come watch us. Get it, Kim. Get it. <laughs> <laughs>